Welcome everyone, and this is lecture 19 of our series on fluids, electrolytes, and acid-base disorders. This series of lectures accompany, expand, and explain my book manual of fluid, electrolyte, and acid-base disorders, a pathophysiologic approach to common and clinical problems. I am Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. This is the book. You can find it on uh, Amazon as an ebook or as a paperback. Uh, hopefully, uh, in the near future, there will be hard copy. You'll find more information in the description below. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the channel. We are still on Chapter 2, Hypokalemia, and this is Part 5, Etiology of Hypokalemia. This is very important. Now, we want to make a diagnosis of hypokalemia, so we in the lab and we want to know why the patient is hypokalemic. There are five causes of hypokalemia. Number one, pseudo-hypokalemia. It's false. Pseudo means false. Number two, intracellular shift of potassium. Number three, non-renal potassium loss and renal potassium loss will be number three and four. These are the most common causes. And then number five is inadequate intake. Now we're going to spend this lecture talking about all these different causes. Number one, pseudohypokalemia. Pseudohypokalemia happens when you have a very high white blood cell count. Instead of 4,000 to 10,000, you have 75,000. And you store the sample, the blood sample, at room temperature. So what happens, those white blood cells will uptake potassium and potassium falls, but this is not true hypokalemia. You see it in patients with acute myelogenous leukemia, AML, because they have very, very, very high white blood cell count. And what do you do? You repeat the sample and you measure potassium quickly. You don't let the sample sit in the lab. So that's easy enough. Number two, intracellular potassium shift or redistribution. The most common causes are related to insulin, especially if you're giving IV insulin, like someone on uh, the protocol for diabetic ketoacidosis, you're going to see hypokalemia. This is why we include potassium in the fluids. Or beta-2 receptor agonists, if you're giving a lot of breathing treatments with albuterol, but you can see it with epinephrine or ephedrine. These are the major causes. But you can see redistribution in hypokalemic periodic paralysis. Probably you'll be lucky if you see one case in your whole career, but you have to know about it. It's common on a test. This is rare, happens usually in Asians with thyrotoxicosis. Other rare causes, this is even rarer than um, uh, hypokalemic periodic paralysis, include verapamil, cesium salts, chloroquine, or barium. Uh, all these uh, Things can cause intoxication and hypokalemia. Antipsychotic medications, risperidone, ketiapine, can rarely cause hypokalemia by intracellular potassium shifts. These things are common, like in case reports and so forth. Uh, you're not going to see it very often, but it's good to keep it in mind. But again, redistribution, keep in mind insulin and beta-2 receptor agonist. Albuterol, insulin, that you have to know. What about non-renal loss? Non-renal loss of potassium is usually GI. And when we say GI, we're talking about vomiting or anyone who induces vomiting, diarrhea, or use of what? Laxatives, NG suction. So all these things can cause non-renal potassium loss. There are things in this category that are really rare. zollinger ellison syndrome, I haven't seen any case ever. Vipoma, very rare. Clay ingestion. Some people have uh, pica and they ingest clay. So don't focus too much on that, but really focus on vomiting, okay, diarrhea, laxatives. Okay, so what happens here? What happens, um, you have loss of potassium, not so much with, with vomiting, okay, but you have secondary hyperaldosteronism. So in these disorders, you're going to have dehydration. Dehydration is going to lead to secondary hyperaldosteronism. And when you have high aldosterone, what's going to happen? You're going to have potassium loss, like we said many times when we talked about potassium physiology. Can you have hypokalemia from excessive perspiration? Yes, but it's not common. It has to be a lot, a lot of perspiration. So again, in vomiting and ingesuctioning. 
you have secondary hyperaldosteronism due to dehydration, but also you have metabolic alkalosis. Why? Because you have loss of chloride. We're going to talk about that in detail when we discuss metabolic alkalosis. Now, hypokalemia is not due to loss of gastric juices, okay, because there's not very much potassium in there. It's from hyperaldosteronism, that is secondary to dehydration, and metabolic alkalosis. This is how you get hypokalemia in vomiting. In diarrhea, on the other hand, you do lose potassium in the stool. Uh, stool is rich in potassium, 80 to 90 equivalent per liter. Now, why do we get hypokalemia with metabolic alkalosis? Well, we said we have intracellular potassium shift. So with alkalosis, you have high bicarbonate. So the hydrogen in the cells is going to go out and potassium is going to go in. So this is how the potassium shifts. Like we said, potassium and hydrogen both have a positive charge. And when hydrogen, which has a positive charge, goes out, then potassium will go in. Also, when you have metabolic alkalosis, you have a lot of bicarb, so you have bicarbonuria. So you have increased bicarb in the urine. And this is a negative ion, okay? It's an anion and is going to create a negative charge and pull potassium out, like we talked about. Moreover, you get secondary hyperaldosteronism when you have dehydration. So you have more than one, one reason um, why you get hypokalemia with metabolic alkalosis. Now, it's common to see hypokalemia in patients on dialysis and proteinal dialysis. Why? Because we dialyze it out. Sometimes uh, we take off more potassium than the patient needs. So this is also common. Um, just a quick note, when you're dialyzing someone, do not check potassium immediately after hemodialysis. Check it after like two to three hours because initially it's always going to be low. It takes time for potassium to redistribute. If you check it initially, it's going to be a little bit low. You're going to replace it and end up with hyperkalemia. Then you'll have to dialyze the patient again. So be careful. Now, uh, renal potassium loss. This is by far the most important category. Here we have medications, hormones, hypomagnesemia, renal tubular acidosis. But by far, the most common cause is going to be diuretics, okay? Thiazide diuretics, loop diuretics are the most common causes of hypokalemia. They increase distal flow. When you increase flow, like we talked about in physiology, you're going to get hypokalemia. They cause volume loss and secondary hyperaldosteronism. High aldosterone means what? Hypokalemia. Now, if you combine two diuretics, metolazone, and a loop diuretic or acetazolamide and a loop diuretic, you're going to get severe hypokalemia. So if you do that, you have to check potassium daily and replace it. Now, other causes that are not as common, high dose penicillin G and penicillin analogs can cause hypokalemia because of increased distal del delivery of non-reabsorbable anion. And when you have this negative charge, it's going to pull the potassium out, which has a positive charge. Primary and secondary aldosteronism, we talked about that, whether you have an adenoma, that is primary aldosteronism, or secondary, uh, like when you have malignant hypertension, that can cause hypokalemia. Magnesium deficiency is very important, okay? Magnesium deficiency can cause refractory hypokalemia. So when you get someone with severe hypokalemia, always check magnesium and replace it. Magnesium inhibits the ROMK channels, the renal, outer, medullary channels. These are the most important potassium channels. Again, we talked about that in the physiology section. I'm going to provide the link. So magnesium kind of like closes the door. So if there's low magnesium, then the door is open. The door in this example is what? The round K channels. And then potassium will escape. So you have to replace both magnesium and potassium. Now, proximal and distal renal tubular acidosis both cause hypokalemia. Now, these are, of course, not very common. Now, they are uh, rare causes of uh, renal potassium loss. Barter syndrome, what you need to know about that, Barter syndrome has the same effect like a loop diuretic. So when you give a loop diuretic, you're going to get hypokalemia, you're going to get alkalosis, there's no hypertension in this disorder. Usually, you see it in children. It has four different variants. Variants and the diagnosis is by genetic testing. Gittleman syndrome, it's kind of like Barter syndrome. It is like giving a thiazide diuretic. So also you're going to get hypokalemia. You're going to get metabolic alkalosis. You have low urine calcium in that disorder. Also 
you don't have hypertension and the diagnosis is genetics. Uh, Little's syndrome, here you have gain of function mut mutation in the ENAC, the uh, epithelial sodium channel. And this is going to increase absorption of sodium. When you have that, you have a negative charge, so potassium is going to go out. This is an autosomal dominant disorder. It's a rare cause of genetic hypertension. It's also common on a test. In all of my career, I've seen one case. And uh, because you have increased absorption of sodium, you have suppressed renin, suppressed aldosterone, hypokalemia, and metabolic alkalosis. It is treated with amylaride or triamterine because those two medications block the ENAC, the epithelial sodium channel. But thiazides will make it worse. So do not use a thiazide diuretic in, in this example. Now, other causes that are rare, mineralocorticoid excess due to congenital adrenal hyperplasia, 11-beta-hydroxy hydroxylase deficiency is in 17-alpha-hydroxylase deficiency. These tend to be more common in children, so may be more relevant to the endocrinologist or the pediatric nephrologist. Malignant and renovascular hypertension, this causes secondary aldosteronism and loss of potassium. Cushing syndrome, it's not very common, and it's less common to see... Uh, uh, potassium wasting, renin secreting tumors, I've never seen a case, ectopic ACTA syndrome, I've never seen a case, um, glucocorticoid remediable aldosteronism is also uh, uncommon and you can read about it if, if you like, um, apparent mineral corticoid excess due to 11-beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 2. So here what, what, uh, what happens um, usually cortisol has to be converted into cortisone with this enzyme. When that doesn't happen, you have excess cortisol, and excess cortisol is like aldosterone. Now, in real life, you don't see that a lot, but with chronic licorice ingestion, uh, some people smoke uh, European licorice or uh, uh, like true tobacco, um, and um, or uh, drink a lot of uh, uh, licorice, and... Um, that causes the same effect. So, so this is like uncommon, but again, you might find it on, on, on a test. If you're perplexed, won't hurt to ask the patient if they chew uh, tobacco, especially European uh, tobacco, which may contain uh, licorice. Now, uh, what about inadequate intake? Inadequate intake, you can see it in TPN if you're not putting enough uh, potassium. Internal nutrition, if you're using a potassium poor solution like uh, Nepro, for example, we use it in our renal patients, but sometimes if they get hyperkalemic, you can change to a different solution. Uh, anorexia and starvation, um, usually the kidneys will preserve potassium, not as much as sodium, but they're good at preserving potassium. So if the intake is really low, you can get hypokalemia. Now, most of the times when you see hypokalemia, think about vomiting or someone who is inducing vomiting, okay, like bulimia and rexa nervosa. Think of diarrhea and laxative abuse and think of diuretics, okay? So vomiting, diarrhea, diuretics, and I would add magnesium deficiency. Are These are the four most common causes. So if you see a patient, think about that, okay? If you're attending, if you're a student or a resident or a fellow, ask you about the causes, think of these first don't say Barter syndrome. Don't, don't say, I think it's Gittleman's. Don't say, I think it's Little syndrome. You're going to see maybe a case in your all career, but you're going to see hypokalemia due to diarrhea, vomiting, laxatives, hypomagnesemia every day. So you have to know all these things, but also you have to prioritize. I'm going to uh, stop here and we'll see you in the next lecture.